Hello, and welcome to today's lesson on polyatomic ions. The question of the day is, what does the prefix poly mean? And after figuring out that, what do you think a polyatomic ion might be? The way I like to describe polyatomic ions is a bundle of atoms that carries a charge. They act as a single unit, kind of like this bouquet of flowers. Um, you wouldn't alter this bundle. You, the bundle kind of works together. Um, all of the flowers together create a bouquet. They have an added beautifulness to them when they're all together. And you wouldn't necessarily go and break that apart. Polyatomic ions kind of are acting in the same way. In a polyatomic ion, again, we're talking about a bundle of atoms that work together. So um, polyatomic ions can bond in ways that are going to put more than just two elements into a compound. A lot of the time we'll call it a ternary compound. Uh, so this is how you get molecules like sodium hydroxide, which is a sodium and oxygen and a hydrogen. In this case, the oxygen and the hydrogen are kind of working together as a polyatomic ion. They, they walk through life together. Of course, we can undergo a chemical reaction and break them apart, but oftentimes they're gonna stick together. We can crisscross with polyatomic ions the same way we had been doing with binary compounds. The reason I like to call the polyatomic ion a bundle though, and that you wanna protect the bundle, is because when you crisscross, the charge needs to go all the way across the bundle of atoms. Um, and that's in both cases. So the charge on the polyatomic ion must go all the way across, and then the charge from typically the metal has to come all the way across the bundle. And I'll show you an example. Occasionally, we're going to have to wrap our polyatomic ions in parentheses in order to indicate that we have multiples of the bundle as opposed to multiples of just a single atom in the bundle. Um, and then a lot of the times our polys are going to have a subscript of their own. So getting a subscript and then crisscrossing, you'll sometimes it looks like there's a double digit. So the point of crisscrossing all the way across and then wrapping in parentheses helps to prevent from our subscripts looking like double digits. So you can see right here, we have calcium and manganese, I'm sorry, permanganate. Manganese is the metal in permanganate. And we are going to crisscross these ion charges. So calcium is going to give away two electrons. It will be a plus two. That plus two is going to get crisscrossed all the way across the bundle over here. It doesn't go in between the, the manganese and the oxygen. It goes all the way across. Manganese is the polyatomic ion of I'm sorry, permanganate is the polyatomic ion of manganese bonded to four oxygens, and that collectively gets a new name, permanganate. And those five atoms together are going to carry a minus one charge, which is going to go all the way across the bundle and hit over here with calcium. Now, um, the reason we have to wrap this in parentheses when the two comes all the way across is because if we didn't, number one, it would look like we had one calcium, one manganese, and 42 oxygens, which would be crazy. Um, but it also helps us to indicate that we don't just have um, two oxygens. We have two of the uh, permanganate ions, that polyatomic ion. So we have... Um, Two permanganates in total, we're gonna to wrap it in parentheses, kind of the same way you would in math. Parentheses are used to kind of hold things together. It's the same thing that's happening here. So I like to, um, when my students start crisscrossing with polyatomic ions, we will always put the polyatomic ion in parentheses. And sometimes if this, let's say were lithium, we'd have a charge of plus one and you'd crisscross a one and there'd be an imaginary one. A, a, Big boy, big girl chemist wouldn't necessarily put parentheses around every polyatomic ion, but as you're learning and figuring it out, it's not an incorrect way to do it. It's just kind of improper. Um, so if that is a set of training wheels that you think you would benefit from, I very much encourage you to do it until polyatomic ions feel like they're second nature to you. If you're not in need of the training wheels, the parentheses, of course, will have to be used sometimes. It's typically any time that this charge is not one to indicate that you have multiples of the whole poly and not an individual atom within the poly. I choose to not have my students memorize polyatomic ions because honestly, even doing chemistry for a lot of my life, I still find myself looking up some charges of polyatomic ions. I usually have a pretty good hold on it, but in my opinion, it's not worth spending the time on. 
Um, so what we are going to do right now is practice some crisscrossing with polyatomic ions to figure out kind of when we need parentheses and when we don't. There are so many polyatomic ions, but I will say that a lot of them have it in common that their names end in eight, A-T-E. A lot of them also end in ite, I-T-E, but there are also some that include neither eight nor ite. So it's important to uh, keep an eye out on your polyatomic ions, but that is a pretty good indicator that you're working with a poly. So right now, um, in this case, it, we're looking to bond nickel plus two and nitrate. So the symbol for nickel is Ni, and in this case, it's going to have a plus two charge, and I have to indicate it because, remember, nickel is a transition metal. Nickel can take on a plus two or a plus three, so um, I'd have to tell you which nickel we're working with. Then we have the nitrate ion, and the nitrate ion is NO3 with a minus one charge. Sometimes you'll just see it as minus, other times you'll see it as minus one, and you'll also see it as one minus. I can't tell you why chemists do the things that they do. Um, <laughs> it's so very silly. Remember, we're only taking the number, not the sign. The sign is really just telling us um, whether electrons were lost or gained. So in this case, we're going to take this one, cross all the way over the bundle, and the nickel is going to get the one. And then over here, the nickel's two is going to crisscross all the way across the bundle and apply back here. So this is telling us we have two nitrates, not 32 oxygens, not two nickels and six oxygens. In, I mean, yes, but not in our subscripts. Specifically, this is saying that we have two nitrate ions, nitrate. So when we um, write the final formula, it's nickel and I with an imaginary one behind it, which I'm choosing not to write because it's improper. Um, then I'm going to put my nitrate in parentheses because they're a poly and I don't want to break that bundle. I want to hold them all together. And then I have two of those nitrate ions. So my formula would be NiNO3, 2. Um, we don't, I don't know that we say parentheses. <laughs> Sometimes we do, I guess. Um, I do when I communicate with my students, but we would just say nickel nitrate. <laughs> Okay, um, next up is cesium, whose symbol is CS, and cesium is a member of group one on the periodic table. It's atomic number 55, and cesium, because it's a member of group one, has one valence electron. It will always try to get rid of that one valence electron, leaving it with a overall plus one charge. And then the oxalate ion, I never remember what it is, so I look it up. Um, oxalate is C2. O4, and it carries a minus two charge. So if we were to go and crisscross this, this two on the oxalate is going to go all the way across the bundle, leaving us with CS2. And then this one is going to go all the way across the bundle and wind up back here. So if you are um, a baby chemist and you're just getting started, you may write CS2, so two cesiums, and then because it's a poly, you would put it in parentheses, C2, this does not look like a two, O4, and then you'd plop that imaginary one back there. Now, because this is an imaginary one, it means that we're not really required to write these parentheses because if we wrote one oxalate ion, it means that there's at least one oxalate ion. That's the way that chemists see it. So they're pretty lazy. Um, they would simplify this writing. So that would be CS2, C2, O4. You do not have to hold your polyatomic ion together when you write a full formula. So this is what I would call the training wheels version for when you're just getting started. And then this, this would be the proper version. So technically both of them are correct, but some answers are just more proper than others. So this would be the final um, professional chemist proper answer because we don't need parentheses in this case. Okay, final example is potassium bonding with sulfur. So potassium is also a member of group one, just like cesium. So it'll have a plus one charge. And then the sulfate ion is SO4 
with a minus two charge. Some of the polys you will find yourself memorizing on purpose and others you'll find yourself uh, memorizing accidentally just because you use them so often. So after the charges are listed, we can crisscross them. We would bring a one all the way across the bundle behind the four. And then we would take this two and crisscross it all the way across the bundle to the potassium. And we would be left with K2, again, training rules version, SO, goodness gracious, SO4 um, with that one that got crisscrossed over. So that's our training wheels version. And then our full proper chemist answer, our full proper chemist's answer would be K2SO4. And this is because we don't need the parentheses to indicate that there's one sulfate ion because writing SO4 is enough to indicate that we have one sulfate ion. So that is what I have for you on polyatomic ions. Please make sure to leave any questions you have in the comment section below the video. Subscribe so you don't miss the next lesson, and I will see you there. Bye.